This is certainly a, a, an amazing chapter in the book of Revelation because you've got all these verses s- spanning a whole period of time and they're so concentrated and you get all the details about these beast fe- features that we've been talking about. There are one or two chapters in Revelation particularly like that, aren't there? 16 is another one because 16 goes really right the way through from the end of the Holy Roman Empire through all the time that we're in there right up to the end of all things. And it's really useful at times for us to concentrate on those things and and keep ourselves seeing the developments of them, especially for our young people, because there are particular particular progresses which we see in in the book as it goes through. And certainly this chapter 13, and we've already seen the amazing developments uh, of the sea beasts and what what actually happened as far as the, the new regime, as it were, which came in, and reigned over this, Ro- over this Roman Empire. And now we're faced with the 11th verse of the 13th chapter, another beast, and the beast the same word, Therion, coming up out of the earth. Now that's significant, because it says in the other one, coming up out of the sea, this is coming out of the earth. And I mentioned that I thought, and most commentators feel that coming up out of the sea was the Mediterranean Sea and all those countries uh, surrounding it were those of the Western Empire that were associated with it. This is coming up now out of Europe, as it were, out of the earth of Europe, and associates those nations. So it, it's a similar sort of thing, but the, the unique part about it, we're given in this uh, 11th verse, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now the two horns like a lamb we haven't come across before, but the dragon influence we've seen all the way through and it's normally associated with Justinian uh, in the east and associated with uh, the results of the pagan empire and the pagan thought that that inspired it. And so we have got some already some interesting clues from what's already gone before. And he had these two horns and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So it's not something separate. It's not a separate beast. And remember, these are, these are just visions and, and um, uh, symbols for the same thing. So this is a symbol about man's nature, about man's empire. Um, and he's in a similar line of the first beast, causing the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And remember how the, the, uh, the result of the fall of um, Rome in AD 476 was, it was then healed, and that was a, a great sign to all the people round about. Uh, so there is a, when it says it causes the earth, there's a pressure point here. This is what we're talking about within these things. Pressure able to be applied. So the new beast arises out of the earth. Concerned with events in the west, it appears as a lamb with two horns. And we put forward the view, when we look at history, around this time when the the fall of the previous uh, monarch, um, that we're really looking at something which is called the Holy Roman Empire. Because it is most unique how the descriptor which comes in here, this lamb with two horns, because you've got something <coughs> together but pu- pulling to- unitedly, but sometimes pulling in different directions, but joined together. <coughs> and it's, we've reckoned that that is talking about the Pope looking at the religious side and the, the uh, dragon, the other horn. And of course what actually happened in AD 800 uh, was that the Pope, the papacy had got to a very low point and had turned to Pippin and, and the other ones for help. And as a result of all this, uh, in AD 800, the Pope actually put the, put the crown, the iron crown, uh, onto, uh, basically onto Charlemagne, who had saved him out of that. And therefore you, you had the beginning of uh, a, a joint Pope and Emperor. So this, remember I said earlier that when Constantine moved his centre to, uh, um, to Constantine, Constantinople, and he left Rome, as it were, unguarded, and allowed the popes then to be able to, to get larger and stronger, 
So what has happened now is that those two have now coalesced together and you end up with this amazing thing which in fact went on for over a thousand years in the middle of Europe, a thousand years, a cooperation basically between the Pope on one hand and the Emperor on the other hand. And they're speaking with the same voice as a dragon. In other words, it's, it's the military force, it's the pressure which is being applied. So really we're not talking about free will, worship of God as it were, there's, there's a military pressure, and I shall expose that as we come to look at this as we go through. It's a combination of things. And so, the beasts in the apocalypse, the beasts of the sea, headquarters in Rome, then in Constantinople. Now, the beast of the earth in central Europe, headquarters in Vienna, then moved to Berlin. And from this, uh, we have the Holy Roman Empire. It has been said by a commentator that it was neither holy nor Roman, but we'll not pass that aside. Under the power of the Eastern Emperor had been the pagan dragon. So Charlemagne united Germany under the Franks, the Franks German Empire united with the papacy, and the Holy Roman Empire was formed on the 25th of December. It was Christmas Day when suddenly the Pope put the crown onto the head of Charlemagne, most unexpectedly. That was 25th of December, 800. And in fact, as we shall see a bit later, that ended, and we've got a specific end date of that Holy Roman Empire, August the 6th, 1806. So it's a real entity that we're talking about in history, which has had a dramatic effect down a thousand years of European history. Countries of the Holy Roman Empire... It was a feudal monarchy encompassing present-day Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Austria, Czech and Slovak republics, as well as parts of eastern France, Italy and western Poland. <coughs> and so the beast of the earth, I'm suggesting rather than sisters, by inspecting what has actually happened and the details of what the scripture gives us, putting those two together, we can see that it could only refer to uh, the beast of the earth as being the Holy Roman Empire. And I hope later on we'll just have a look at this and see if there's any other evidence because one of the things mentioned in the setup to what we're doing today is, well, what are the evidences for these things? So I should try and get some further evidence beside the inspection evidence where it's obvious that the, the two horns are talking about the, the Pope and, and the Emperor and so on. But we'll work along those two, along those two lines. AD 800 to 1806. The Pope and Emperor, as equals, sees a new elevation in papal power because he's got the very, very powerful Charlemagne as the first Emperor. The Pope, and this is how it worked out, the Pope as the spiritual Emperor and the Emperor as a secular Pope. And so the, the, the two roles are sort of fused and intermingled between them. <coughs> the Beast of the Earth is a new development out of the beast of the sea. Now that's very, very important. It's not a separate thing. They're all going on and the, and the one encompasses the other. It's most important to not think this is a separate thing at all. It's a further development over a thousand years of history. Both are present. As we read in the 12th verse, he exercises all the power of the first beast, the beast of the sea in his sight, and causes the earth and them which dwell there to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was, see, was healed. So the Spirit is, is making absolutely sure that we don't think this is something quite separate. So the Holy Roman Empire in action, people of the Empire, were constrained to still worship the sea beast, who was himself controlled by the Pope. But what is happening as we look into history is that the sword of Charlemagne is extended, not merely to extend his empire, as was always the case. But here, here is the change which comes about. But is it extended to extend Christianity? So you've got the amazing fact of one of the emperors in Rome using his sword and his pressure to extend beliefs. And that's what we see here. The sword of Charlemagne extended not merely to extend his empire, but to extend Christianity. Now, so I'm trying, as I go through this, well, is this really true? Did, can we um, imagine this to be true? 
Well, I did a bit of work into the background, because this Charlemagne, we know the word, but most of us don't know much about him anyway. <coughs> but um, I had a look, and I'll just make a little brief excerpt out of this, just to say, you know, any of us with this modern technology... We've got no excuses, brethren and sisters. When you think of what Brother Roberts and those at this age, what they went through to dig out those early writings and to go and go into libraries and copy out from old books and so on. And we've got it here at the touch of a switch, brethren and sisters, easily. And, and what, is ama- what is actually stored in the history of these, of these things. It's just amazing. We should really all be going through the details of what our previous brethren have dug out and we can extend to them easily and our young people can be finding out with, with new things to put into it showing the importance of what God has done. And I don't think we're doing this at all. We're, we're using all this technology for total rubbish, sending Facebook and this sort of stuff. Whatever good does that do? It just wastes our time. Do we do that? People in the world do two, two or three hours every day. But we've got access to these things. That Brother Thomas was living there, having going through it in the darkness, or writing out, and, and he was actually uh, translating the languages as he could find them. But we've got it all just absolutely on a plate, brethren and sisters. And, and what are we doing with it? Nothing, as far as I can see. The young people are sending messages to and fro. But... There is a great responsibility there and a great opportunity for us all to be extending and getting for ourselves that conviction of what it's about. That's what I'm talking about. Because if we extend and find things out for ourselves, that's how we get conviction of the truth. And we we hear that our young people have have got to go and uh, do this and that and the other and and have... uh, and go and change our, our, our meetings and so on and so forth. All of this comes about from a lack of appreciation of what the truth is and of not digging our roots deeply into what the Holy Spirit would. And yet we've got, in our hands, we've actually got something which our forefathers would have, would have I would say, given their right hand for. So that's just a... I'll come back from another little hobby horse there. I'm sure you'll be thankful to hear. And uh, so I've got to say, is this true? Well, I had a little look, as one can, in two minutes. Well, what was Charlemagne? Oh, just put it in. Two minutes later, this is what it was like. Here he is. Einhard's life of Charlemagne, two minutes flat. He was a great military conqueror and channeled his talent into the service of the church. Hey, oh, now this writer says that straight away. Right, no, no prompting. In the service of the church. For in taking over most of Western Europe and a fair bit of these, he used military force to compel all his subject peoples to become Christian. So that's just what Revelation has said, and that's, that's two minutes' work to look up uh, Charlemagne on the search. See, that's what, and what I find is, brothers and sisters, every time I do that, I come up with a fulfilment that I've never expected before, but it super abundantly underlines as true what I've been looking for. Every time it comes up and it gives you that, that confidence in what we're telling ourselves, it's really true and we can tell a bit more. So I'm telling you this a little bit now. You probably didn't know about that. <coughs> so when it says he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from well, we know enough about symbology of revelation to know we don't actually mean tongues of flame coming. But, but tongues of flame and fire is that which does things and which changes states and, and which makes things happen, doesn't it? So, <clears throat> verse 30. He maketh fire come down from heaven. That's a symbol for war and commands which he's picking up from the Pope and, and which the emperor is now making the people do. Symbol for war and commands. Verse 14, <coughs> by signs and wonders the beast deceived them, ghosts and miracles and resurrections, as reported in the decline and fall. And he goes into all that, and we're, we're going back to the basic people who have, have these ideas uh, which the pagans did, and they could be influenced by them. And the beast proposed the image 
I, an administration to implement decisions just like the Roman Empire. See, we don't remember, we don't think about that. We just think about the emperor and the, and the pope. But behind all these people, I don't know whether you've had anything to do as such with looking at what the pope has, has said in about history, but if you ever do, what you will be struck with is the pages and pages of, of script, if you've ever looked at it, what's down in the records of what these people have left is just amazing. They spend all their life writing things down and justifying things. And it was then, it was in the Roman Empire. So, the, the um, signs and wonders that the beast is seen that repose this image I an administration to implement decisions just like the Roman rulership. And all the time there were these people writing down what the common people had to do to make sure they didn't get out, out of it. And so all the time, the result, there was a pressurising down on personal individuality that was taking place uh, in the Roman Empire at this time as a result of this, of this pressure coming from, uh, from the two sides. And indeed, as we shall see in a minute, it, it blew up in a minute, didn't it? Uh, the image lives and speaks. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So, so that administration of all those people, it actually did things and made things happen and write things down. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause. There are cause. That who, who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So that, that is how... What we just read that the Charlemagne did, that's how he pressurised people to believe things. At the end of a sword, that's how this happened. <coughs> so that the, to worship the image of the beast should be killed. Victoria Charlemagne had military power to give political vitality to the papal image of the beast. And that's, that's this amazing combination which there is there. So the Pope, in alliance with Charlemagne, develops the administration, the image. And I just looked into that, and again, just two minutes looking at Google, and you find out that the general councils, the image, where the College of Bishops with the Pope formulate, formulated decrees just like those of the Roman emperors, particularly applies to the Pope's ruling of the papal states. The Pope sold an absolute ruler in his own territory, a small replica of the ancient Roman Empire. So much in this is, is doing what these people are making others to do. <clears throat> and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. They were no longer free, brethren and sisters. They, they received a mark. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. Mark in the forehead is the thinking, the blaspheming, slanders the truth. The hand is for doing trading activity. The church had complete hold over spiritual and literal trading, brothers and sisters. All written and prophesied 800 years plus before it happened. Now think about that. Think about the prophecy that enabled that specifically to be written down. And uh, indi indisputably, because the, those copies of the, of the text are available, uh, and that was written down. The beast is to compel people to worship it. The mark is a symbol for thinking in the forehead, and doing hand without the mark could not trade. And that is the, the unitary mind. People were being forced to all think the same things, and think things which are in accordance with what the Roman Catholic Church, aided by the state, wants them to, to, to perform. The mark is the impression of the unitary mind, all written down in 1896. The sign, the literal mark of the beast. Well, there's the sign of the cross, the genuflection, which you see on all sides. There's the cross itself used on church decoration outside and in. There's the mark made on priests at ordination and on babies when christened. And there's the mark sign on foreheads and bodies. They brought everyone into this terrible low point where the word of God and its truth and its love was totally pushed under feet. Here is wisdom in the 18th verse. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. 
for it is the number of a man, it is number is 603 score and 6. And so the uh, scriptures are asking us to pay attention to detail and to counting. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the seven mountains, the, the seven hills of Rome, we have wisdom to be able to sort these things out and to understand, put them together. And that's what the scripture uh, is in Revelation 17 is, is implying us to do. The image spoke binding decrees to enforce men to worship. It subdued and killed true believers who stood out against godless decrees. The empire enforced its authority with the sword. It had the form of the older empire. And something like, so I'm told, 250 administrators controlled the hundreds of decrees called capitularies, great improvements came. That's what was going on in the background of all this president system. It's right there at the touch of a button. This is what these people were being subject to. It's just, just like we see happens in, in some countries of the world today. We understand that in some countries of the world, if you say a word to your neighbour, then that gets reported back to, to someone else. There are, there are communities, aren't there, in this world, who are labouring like that. And this is what came under this terrible uh, Holy Roman Empire. And if a man consider the original of this great ecclesiastical domain, he will easily perceive that the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof, for so did the papacy start up on a sudden out of the ruins of the heathen power. Written by Thomas Holmes, who sees all the way through the, it's a continuity. It's, it's man's world and man's will a, against God. The number of a man? Well, I'm sure we've all looked at this in one way or another. The Greek word Latinos in numerology, in other words, if you give a number to each of the Greek letters, it corresponds to 666. There are a number of <coughs> such words which have been looked at. <coughs> the number of flesh in Scripture is 6. 666 six, six is the number of flesh tripled, so you would expect 666 six, six to be a, a terrible representation of just how bad flesh is. So we're talking about this two-horned and the operation of it and what it actually did as far as the people to whom it, it concerns is. And certainly rivalry did exist between the Pope and the Emperor, as you can imagine. And between the 10th and 13th century, there was a, this thing going on. But gradually, you can probably know what would happen because the Pope gained the ascendancy. Because belief in the immortality of the soul the spiritual claims of the papacy over men's lives, the granting of, of uh, release and so on from sins, at the end of the day, the, the battle was going always to be won by the papacy out of it. And so that's what actually happened. Spiritual claims of the papacy over men's lives inevitably triumphed. And so by 1073, the Pope in Rome claimed that it, he claimed the divine right to be supreme in all temporal and spiritual. Notice what he's saying when we talked about this, this two of them side by side. But by 1073, 200 years later, he says the divine right to be supreme in all temporal and spiritual matters, Pontifex Maximus, the greatest pontiff. And of course, Pontifex Maximus is where it all started off because August, Augustine, uh, who was the spiritual high priest of the papacy, of the paganism, that's what his title originally was. And so that has gone through and been taken over uh, by the Pope. And so, uh, coexistence of the beast in the east, the dragon was enthroned at Constantinople. In the west, there was the beast of the sea with the name of blasphemy. Its Latin kingdoms, deeply influenced by the increasing authority of the Pope. In the centre and to the north, there was the beast of the earth, the Holy Roman Empire, its dual liaison, causing constant increase in the prestige of the Pope. And finally, uh, the states of the church were an ecclesiastical temporal domain. Though small, the influence and power was as great as real earthly monarchy. And that is what had come in, into being as a result of all of these things. So the dynasty of Charlemagne in this it became 
a largely Germanic empire. And it's very interesting how, as you study this, it started off uh, with France being involved in, with Germany. But it wasn't long before France started going away from it, and it became, in the end, a German, <coughs> a, a German thing. The dynasty of Charlemagne, succeeded by that of Otto I and others in his line, French were less influenced. The Artonian church system of the Reich, we've heard that before, the realm, and that's what it means, provided stable and long-lasting framework for Germany. The empire was successful in increasing power overall and amassing wealth. It became largely based on Germany and changes in France gradually resulted in less influence of France in the empire. So it actually did become known in those Middle Ages as the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And so as, as time went on, getting into the, the Middle Ages again, there did come a great schism in the Roman Catholic Church. In the 4th century and onwards, the two sides, the West and the East, separated, uh, and it did result in the great schism of 1054, which of course still absolutely divides the Roman Catholic Church in the West from the, the others in the East and still very much applies to Dale although it's, it's correct to say that there's great efforts going on all the time to try and unite the two halves I know Pope Benedict said that his mission was to make sure that, that, that the Church breathes with her two lungs again that is to say the, the East and the Western Empire that has still not taken place. It's interesting, though, that um, Mr. Putin is very much an Orthodox Christian and has done a massive amount to breathe life into the Orthodox Christians in the Eastern Empire. I'm still expected to see some interesting developments there. But judgments were going to be poured out. Why were judgments poured out? In Revelation 9 it says that the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. Now, I, I think things like that we should just hold on to, brethren. It's because it's easy just to look at slaughter and all the terrible things going on and to forget that this is a God of love who's trying to do these things and that, and that he has compassion about them. But there are things that he cannot do. The rest of these men, they repented not. He tried whatever means were appropriate, yet they repented not. And that's what... He's looking at all times for people to be prepared to repent and to turn the other cheek. God had a remedial desire to save. He still has. He doesn't wish the death of any. And we must bear that in mind all the time when we're looking at these wars and tumults and so on. It isn't God's will that these things are happen. It's men, what God is doing is simply forecasting as he sees how it's going to work out and gives the opportunity for men to make it work out in a different way. Rarely do they take that opportunity. God has a remedial desire, and that's what, of course, brings each one of us into it, because he wants us to be in the kingdom, and those we are associated with, as much as that. He doesn't wish the death of any, but that through these examples and these lessons, he's speaking to each one to see if they will turn willingly from <coughs> these wrong things and live. Populations continued addicted to the doctrines and practices of the mother church. Dreadful effects of wrong beliefs, slaughter of heretics and Jews in Inquisition, the fraud of purgatory, sorcerers, the immorality, and there's just a total list of what they go through, the immoralities of a celibate priesthood and fornication, the sale of indulgences, credulity, superstition, reverence for the clergy. These all took the place of faith. And belief and a real reverence for God was nowhere to be seen in this dreadful thing. And so, well, seething discontent and a harsh papal rule eventually led to the French Revolution of 1789. And one of the commentators says, in a political sense, it is still proper to date the age in which we live from the French Revolution. The shock carried by that revolution and the spread of its principles has produced repercussions ever since and we're living within those. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, the symbols again, the earthquake uh, in the political things of the 
of the uh, uh, politics. And the results of the French Revolution still proper to date the age in which we live from the French Revolution and the spread of its principles. Humanism, socialism, democracy have echoed in calls for freedom worldwide ever since. And so the time came when the Holy Roman Empire had come to the time when God had decreed that it would come to an end. And the violence of the set of signs which God had set in motion all those years before and uh, they, come, they pour out in the 16th chapter and the 2nd verse. The first vial, 1789, poured onto the Roman earth, whose power is now vested in the papal Roman system. This produced a grievous sore ulcer upon those identified with the beast, and the French Revolution was the beginning of a running sore which affected nations outside even of France. On the earth, the French Revolution, an open running sore. And the second poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. And we've got to keep looking at that again, remembering that we're talking about sign languages, the conquest of Napoleon and Europe extended beyond the earth uh, to the sea and resulted in naval battles involving Britain and particularly blockades. And actually if you look in detail at what Napoleon did, it's very, very accurate. These, these signs are very, very accurate in terms of what happened uh, in these wars. The sea trade certainly stagnated. And the third angel uh, poured his onto the rivers and fountains of water, symbolising the victories of Napoleon on the Alpine districts and northern Italy. The fourth angel showed his vial upon the sun to scorch men with fire on the ruling power of the empire. And the fifth angel poured out his vial on the seat of the beast, the kingdom full of darkness, the seat or the throne of the beast. And so the French Revolution was the beginning of a running sword which affected many nations outside of France. They had all, in the 1260 years of the papacy, since its institution by Justinian, committed fornication with her, and their populations had all been drunk with the wine of her fornications. And so the nations of Europe massed on the borders of France in support of the nobility. These wars brought the French general, Napoleon, to the fore. The most important output of the French Revolution was the revealing of his genius. Napoleon seized power in 1799 after defeating the French government installed by the Revolution. Which is interesting in itself, because the French Revolution had instilled that government and yet Napoleon now brings that down. He crowned himself emperor in the presence of the Pope. How different from how the Pope was crowned in AD 800. Napoleon knew exactly what he was going to do. He was not going to be under the thumb of any papal power. He crowned himself emperor in the presence of the Pope and sought to be a second Charlemagne. His military genius achieved outstanding victories in campaigns throughout Europe and the Roman Catholic countries. It's interesting that whenever Napoleon went outside of those Catholic countries, he, he lost every battle that he fought. As long as he was inside, then he was most victorious. And so the vials 1 to 5 bring to an end, and gradually, the downfall of the Holy Roman Empire. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat, emperor's throne of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Pope Pius VII, was imprisoned by Napoleon and his kingdom became full of darkness. You can't believe it, can we? And that is quite recently that he was actually imprisoned and his kingdom became full of darkness. 1809, brethren and sisters. So it's not that long ago. You see, we're so used to taking into fact the Pope, with all his pageantry, he flies all over the world and is acknowledged as a world-class statesman. It was only a hundred or so years that he was, he was in jail, brethren and sisters, and he's, he's done a dramatic resurgence back again, uh, which the, the book of the Apocalypse showed he would. Pope Pius VII was imprisoned, and his kingdom uh, was full of darkness. And the thing that had upset him most of all was that those papal states which the papacy had inherited in 800 were annexed and taken out of the way. 
And it all came to an end in 1806, the Battle of Austerlitz. Napoleon, with 68,000 troops, defeated almost 90,000 Russians and Austrians at the Battle of Austerlitz. The last Holy Roman Emperor, Francis II, abdicated following this military defeat by Napoleon at Austerlitz. And the empire was dissolved on 6th of August, 1806. So we, we know the exact date from these wonderful historical events again of when the Holy Roman Empire, having started it AD 800, it finally came to an end a thousand, in a thousand, after a thousand six years. I'm still wanting somebody to tell me. I mean, it's, it's like a thousand years. It's, it's like the millennium. It's man's millennium. But where's the six years come from? Can anybody tell me that? I haven't found that out at the moment. I suppose it's just saying, well, it isn't actually a millennium. It's something just to remind yourself of it. So it came to that end. The end of the Holy Roman Empire. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so just a little <coughs> bit of a recap. And I said, <coughs> that what I tried to do was not only really just to say what well, well, it looks like this as being that, but can we get evidence? So I've given you one or two things. Now, have a look at this, this recapitulation. You see, of the Daniel 7 and Revelation 17... Uh, we both, they both have ten horns, both endure through history, they're slain at the judgment, both blaspheme, and both the bodies given to the burning flame. So the beasts of Revelation reveal the future developments of Daniel's false beast. Yes. Now, is there <coughs> any evidence, though, to secure this identification? You could say, well, that's a smashing picture you've built up. Yeah, but, but what's the evidence for it? You're saying, well, it, it looks like this, this two-headed thing, and, and then there was this political organisation, and so on and so forth, and that's it. Okay, but is that evidence? Well, no. Well, I don't expect you'll think this is evidence either, but let me just have a look at it. I'm going back to my Google thing. I'm going to ask somebody to have a look at their Google and see if they can help. The two witnesses, I haven't, because of the subject that I'm dealing with, I haven't gone to chapter 11, but I'll te- I want just to introduce what it says there. I'm trying to find out uh, whether we can equate anything to do with this empire with France. Chapter 2. 11 verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, may I make another little appeal? Please, I, I'm sure with this audience I don't have to say, but there are so many people, it seems to me, in our community, who as soon as you start talking about scriptural numerology and these wonderful things shown by, by uh, numbers, that they just absolutely turn away, they don't want to know anything about it. How that can be is but utterly beyond me, because there's such evidences of fulfilled things coming out there that, that it just it does worry me that people should be so... Dismissive of it, but here's one. Two witnesses. Now, we might not always agree on what the two witnesses are. My opinion is that there are two categories <coughs> of people that have always been there. there there's, two, there's two witnesses now. They're always around whenever anything happens about human rights or anything like that. They're always ready to go on the news or to, or to do whatever is going to be done, to stand up for somebody who's, who's down. There's always members of that two way. Not necessarily the truth, but they, they have in their own conscience. Uh, they wish to stand up for truth. So, he says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. Okay, so if we're talking about witnesses of the truth, okay, what would be the starting point for witness? Where would these people who he's referring to, where would they start to witness? Well, We've always already seen true believers first came under pressure at a particular point in time, a measurable point in time, when apostate Christianity recognised officially by the Edict of Milan. So there's a point. Now, from that point in time, anybody who didn't accept it were under pressure. So my answer would be, what would be the starting point for true witnessing? It would have to be AD 312 to 313, that's the beginning of when it all started. And on 
the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, when these witnesses were, were killed, was on the 24th of August, 1572. Now just to see what it says. I will give power to my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days. Well, if they started prophesying at that date of when Christianity became recognised, 312 to 313, <coughs> 1260 days after that, uh, would, lead, would lead you to the 24th of August no. the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war now, I haven't done that very well but what I'm looking for is Revelation 11 verse 7 it says as a result of this setup that was there the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war right and then it says, well, I ask the question, well, what is the beast then? And we have a record, and it's on the screen, French soldiers and the Roman Catholic clergy made war. And in history, the gentleman who did it, led them, was a Roman Catholic priest called Edmond Auger. So there's a positive identification. If, you, if the witnessing starts in AD 312 and it was going to take place for 1260 years, it brings you to AD 1572, which is the day of the St. Bartholomew's riots, when thousands of Protestants and Huguenots were slaughtered in the streets of Paris. And do you know, brothers and sisters, I don't know where they've picked up, but that day is commemorated now. Every time. On that date, it's commemorated every year. And uh, there was a, a medal struck, and that was when the French soldiers struck down the Protestants. So who is the beast that the out of the bottom is making war? It's the French soldiers. And it's this particular, it's Edmond Auger, who, who we can see from the records, um, was actually leading it to happen. So the history is, is very, very clear there, I suggest. And it's the first bit of, I think, real evidence to tie up what the beast... What is the beast? We're talking about the beast, so here's my bit of evidence. What is the beast? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's the beast that descendeth out of the bottomless pit... And what, what does it do? It makes war. And what does it consist in? It's the French soldiers and the Roman Catholic clergy. They can read all about it. Pages and pages in history on, the, on your Googles uh, of where that's come from. So that's my evidence, if you like, of what is this beast. So this afternoon we've been talking about the beast in its various phases. <coughs> you can doubt that or what you will. At least it is an, it is an attempt to try and look uh, at some evidence there and, and, and positive things uh, that we can realise. So the beast, I suggest, is positively identified as the Roman Catholic clergy. By the way, 1260 years, which is the prophecy was 1260 days or 42 months, um, brings you to this AD 1572. Um, but it, what it also does, of course, that very date... Uh, does confirm the day for a year and also the 1260 years as an actual confirmation between 312 when the witnessing was started and 1572 so there's, there's a confirmation of that there is also a very interesting sideline to get out of it because the scripture says 11 verse 7 the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit so this beast this French have come out of the bottomless pit. So now we start getting a handle when we read about the bottomless pit. Oh, wait a minute. We know a bit about that because we've seen a bit about that because Scripture has all sorts of ways of confirming you. So that's an interesting thing. We could bear that in mind as to where the bottomless pit is as far as the book of Revelation is concerned. So a final reminder. If any man worship the beast and his image, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Judgments to come. 
ancient of days is set, the judgment was set, and behold, the voice of the great words which the horn spake, his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. And so, as Daniel said, the mouth speaking great things to work throughout history, from the time of Rome till Christ. And if it's going to work, and this is an interesting one, if it is going to work till now, it must be there now. Now that's one that people often don't like this interview. They say, well, okay, it must be there now, because if it's going to work through, throughout history, until Christ comes, it must be there now. So where is it then? Well, we can see it. Let's hope others can. So, wider considerations. Many scriptures identify the development of opposition to true Christians through the ages. We would seek to persecute, who would seek to persecute and eliminate true believers, would become fully mature at Christ's coming, actively oppose him, and finally be destroyed by him. So, we end up with a, a, a warning of error, which is exactly where we start out. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. You don't have to read very deeply into that series of statements there to see what underlines that to what we know has been going on and still going on around us today. Lessons we are to heed the warnings, brethren and sisters. All around us are going back to the Mother Church, any that are other than just uh, having no religion at all. And this should inform our preaching. We are the witnesses in these last days. We have the opportunity of looking at all of these things through, of the scriptures and the historical side like never before, as I've already mentioned. And we can expect Christ to silently take the saints for judgment and preparation any time from this actual minute. I still remain totally convinced that there's no other thing got to be fulfilled in prophecy to, which has to take place before Jesus Christ can take us to judgment. A lot of things will happen after that that we shouldn't necessarily see. So this is just a summary of the main events. We saw the opening vision, then there's the letters to the churches, the vision of the future kingdom on earth, the seal judgments, that's the fall of pagan Rome, the trumpet judgments, the fall of the East and West Empires, the vile judgments, which we've been looking at, particularly the fall of the Holy Roman Empire after, after a thousand and six years. Future, the thunder judgments, the fall of Babylon. And then, chapter 19, the marriage of the Lamb and the fall of the nations, the millennium and the new Jerusalem and the final message. Brothers and sisters, that's what all this leads up to. That's what it's all about. We do pray that each one of us may so take account of our lives and strive with enthusiasm and hope to go forward, knowing that the Lord isn't trying to set barriers and difficulties, but he wants every single one of us in the kingdom. If we don't go, we are the ones who've erected the barriers. And I looked, and lower lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred, forty, and four thousand are in the Father's name written in their foreheads, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. May we be part of that glorious crown.